Good morning. I have a little bit of uh, housework to do up here. Wasn't it good to have the youth band today? As you will uh, hear later, they uh, actually, whether you knew it or not, provided the halftime entertainment. I'm just going to tip a couple of things out here. I know what's happening right now for some of you in the audience. You're feeling very uncomfortable, particularly those of you from rugby playing nations. You see the all-black jersey and you think, oh no, we're going to get another thrashing, um, which probably is true when it comes to rugby, but hopefully by the end of uh, this morning's message we'll be on the same side. And uh, if not, perhaps you should change your team. In honour of the Grey Cup game this afternoon, I thought I'd deliver this morning's message in the form of a pre-game talk. After last year's um, surprising, at least it was surprising to me, uh, stampeded defeat at the hand of Ottawa, I'm sure that there has been a lot of evaluating a lot of soul searching and a lot of preparation that has gone in for this afternoon's game against Toronto, which interestingly enough is the only sports team from Toronto that I don't support. The coaching staff will be trying to employ any means at their disposal to motivate their players to achieve their goal. And what is the goal? Well, obviously, to win the Grey Cup. In that sense, a motivational speech, a pre-game speech, utilizes some of the many rhetorical devices that we also see are used by the New Testament writers in trying to move their readers or their listeners to act in a certain way, specifically through the use of knowledge and emotion. We're given information that explains why we should act in a certain way and an appeal to our emotion often gives us the inspiration to actually act in that manner. Unfortunately, we're not all motivated equally by the same means of communication. What, com what uh, motivates one person may in fact cause another person to shut off. And that's why effective communication needs to come at different levels. We have a group level, the sort of motivational group speech, but we also have the one-to-one -one talk. And whether you're a coach or whether you're a pastor or a preacher, both of those levels are relevant. So today I'm going to shoot at the general audience and realize that in doing so, some of you will shut down. Uh, then it's up to Shane and the other members of the pastoral staff to address the issues I have raised one by one to help you motivate you uh, back to achieve the goal. You're welcome. Mm. Okay, in our case, um, it's not so much a pre-game speech, it's more of a half-time speech because the game that we participate in has already begun and dare I suggest some days at least it feels like we're losing. Some days it feels like we're losing. Now every pre-game show has a commercial break and this morning is no exception because we are sponsored by Motivational Jewelry. Charlene and, I, yeah, you, Charlene and I thought that we'd like to raise some funds for a specific Mennonite Brethren Church in Choco, Colombia. That's Colombia with two O's. And how, I thought, can I possibly raise money for this good cause? And then I realized I love wearing necklaces. So I often have, uh, I have a series of necklaces. Most of them are like this one, which is uh, a fish hook. And it helps me remember what my own personal mission statement is and what it's all about. Um, after retiring from running in the summer and reevaluating that, I decided once more um, that I should also take up running. And so I needed some necklaces that helped me motivate me in that particular cause. So I have this one. Do you know what that is? Yeah, it's a little man running. And this helps me realize that my identity is tied up with running. But then I have this little necklace. You know what that is? Unicorn, because a unicorn is the symbol of the Boston Marathon. 
And so that helps me realize what my goal is. My goal is once again in April to uh, return to Boston and once again try and achieve the goal that I as of yet have not achieved. Um, now to do that, I need another necklace which is one that will help me realize that to achieve my goal, I may have to undergo a certain amount of suffering and sacrifice and pain. And I need to realize that sometimes that's a necessary part of what one must do. And therefore, I've decided to make some motivational jewelry. Uh, I haven't made it yet, but I'm going to use this. Do you know, you know what this is? It's my toenail. Yeah, well done. <laughs> So this is uh, one of my big toenails. Now, okay, granted, it's a little bit rough, but I thought that if I shaped it with some sort of artistic design and removed the obvious offense and disgust, I could even gold plate it, right? And then I could sell them at the end of the service as pieces of motivational jewelry. And if I do a good job, um, you won't even have to be a runner to wear one of these. Now, Kyle, I expect that you'll be ordering one straight away. But wait, there's more, because there always is. If you buy this particular piece of motivational jewelry straight after the service, I will also give you two little toenails that can be converted into motivational earrings, and they will match your necklace. So, back to our pre-game show. This morning is the final message in a, uh, a series that Shane has referred to as the Preposterous Series. It's a ser uh, series on the Sermon of the Mount. And this morning I'm going to be focusing specifically on verses 21 to 23 of Matthew 7. Um, but from verses 24 following, it really is the final summary, if you like, of the sermon. I'm going to sketch the context for 21 to 23 and hope that you're able to see why verses 24 following have the impact that they do. Uh, but I preached on verses 24 following. Uh, there is no vanilla in the Lord's deep freeze. Of course, you all remember it. It wasn't that long ago, so I'm not going to repeat it. What I am going to do right now, though, is I'm going to read from chapter 7, verse 13 following, so that we get the whole final section uh, of the Sermon of the Mount. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who take it, for the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits, are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good fruit, nor can a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built this house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like the foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Now when Jesus had finished the, saying these things, the crowd were astounded at his teaching for he taught to them as one having authority, not as their scribes. The Sermon on the Mount ends with four warnings. Four warnings. Each of them in the form of a paired contrast. Verses 13 to 14, we see there are two ways. There are the narrow way 
and the uh, wide way, the gates, narrow and wide gates. The second warning, we're told there are two trees and they produce different types of fruit, good fruit and bad fruit. In verses 21 to 23, which is uh, my focus of this morning, there are two claims, the claim of the true disciple and the claim of the false disciple. And finally, there are two builders, verses 24 to 27, the wise builder and the foolish builder. In each of these warnings, we um, find that there's a call to decision. There are only two options. In each of these warnings, we're given two options. We heed the warning, we hear, understand, and obey the teachings of Jesus, which is my definition of a disciple, or we reject them, and we're not a disciple. The key to the warnings is to respond in obedience to Jesus. So let me now focus then on verses 21 to 23, and then I'll make some more general observations later on. This is the third of the four warnings. Now, it's a warning. Okay, so you have to pay attention. It's a serious warning. We can't just sort of gloss over it. And the warning begins by saying, Lord, Lord. Now, it depends on when you are reading this or listening to this as to what that might mean. The original people that heard Jesus teaching that when they heard, Lord, Lord, it's pre-resurrection. They don't know that Jesus is going to be crucified, that he is going to be uh, raised from the dead. And the term probably simply meant uh, sir or teacher. But the readers of the Gospel of Matthew, now remember, Matthew was written after the resurrection, so the readers know that Christ now wasn't you know, just a person wandering around Galilee coming up with these wonderful little sayings. He, in fact, was God incarnate they would understand the title as a title of worship. And so we have this double meaning here. Carson refers to it as a title of fervency. And so at the very least, what we see is that the people that Jesus is referring to here are fervent. You know, they're coming up and they're saying, Lord, Lord. They're actually a little shocked, as we will discover. After the Lord, Lord, we, he makes this reference to the kingdom of heaven, which elsewhere uh, the other gospel writers talk about the kingdom of God. The kingdom, I've said on numerous occasions, is not a geographic location. Okay, It's a reign or a rule. To be in the kingdom doesn't mean you live in a certain country. It means that you submit to the king. So the people who are in the kingdom are those who submit to to the king. And that's why we have that parallel there about the will of my father. It is those who do the will of my father. They are the ones who are submitting to the king. They are the ones who are in the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, this kingdom transcends nationality or ethnicity or any sort of social status. And indeed, this allegiance to the king has priority over every other allegiance that we have including family. Now, I think the church has missed a huge opportunity here. And this is my, you know, the thing that drives me more crazy right now than any other thing. That and the Leafs losing. But this is more of a surprise. We are not primarily Canadians. We are not primarily Americans or New Zealanders. We are primarily citizens of the kingdom of heaven. That should be our priority. We are not members of a particular political party. We might be, but that is not our priority. We're not conservatives or liberals or Democrats or Republicans. We are servants of Jesus Christ. And everything else must come secondary to that. The moment that you're with a group of Christians and they put their country or their political views ahead of your relationship in Christ, something has gone horribly wrong. And it's very confusing to the world out there when they hear that this is a Christian party, this is a Christian country. It is not the case. Being in the kingdom of heaven means primarily our allegiance is to Jesus Christ. And I think we need to seriously rethink what that means. Because I think we have an opportunity to present to the non-Christian world 
a very strong united message here and we're blowing the chance. And instead we have Christians speaking against Christian because our primary allegiance is to one of those other groups. We see the notion of the will of my Father. That's how we enter the kingdom of heaven, through submission, through obedience to Christ's words. Note in the Lord's Prayer earlier in Matthew, it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And once again, we see that parallel. It's the old song, Trust and obey, for there's no other way. Very little has changed over the time. And then Jesus refers to that day, on that day. That's the day of final judgment. The claim being made by the disciples here is that the disciples, because they prophesied, because they cast out demons, because they performed miracles in the name of Jesus. They were exercising charismatic gifts. And there's no indication in this passage that these were not genuine acts of God's Spirit. And yet Jesus is saying that the evidence of true discipleship is not the exercise of spiritual gifts or even the fruitful exercise of spiritual gifts. The evidence of discipleship is obedience to Christ. Uh, I became a Christian in my early 20s, in the 80s, when Mike Wonky, uh, some of you may or may not have heard of him, Mike Wonky was one of the uh, best Christian communicators out there. He was very funny, and he had some great stories. And I have to say that he immensely encouraged me. I grew in my Christian faith because of his ministry. Unfortunately, Mike Wonky was a little bit of a fraud. He'd had multiple wives, you know, Money was going to them to support them, and who knows what. There was all sorts, some of the stories were lies, if not most of them. Um, my point is, nevertheless, there was genuine fruit from his ministry, but he himself, at that stage anyway, was not living as a disciple of Christ. We have to differentiate between the two and realize that a fruitful ministry does not necessarily mean that the channel is a faithful disciple. In the time of Christ, a rabbi might distance himself from others by saying, I have nothing to do with you. It was called a rabbinic ban. Jesus is taking this a step further, and he actually says to these people, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. I can, look, in my wildest dreams, I could not say anything anywhere near as offensive as what Jesus is saying. Here are people ministering in his name, seeing the Spirit work through that ministry, and he's calling them evildoers. Like, seriously? How to influence people, eh? How to make friends. Good job. I mean, this is a moment where we should be going, Whew. there's a big wall factor here. Jesus said, I will declare. This is a position of judgment, a position held by God. The final judgment being made here is being made by Jesus. He puts himself in that position of God. When I started playing around with this message a few weeks ago, I started listening to what people were saying about Jesus and Christians in our wider society. And I thought, are you kidding me? Do you not know who you are mocking? Do you not realize who you're ridiculing? You are rejecting the only hope you have for life. When you reject Christ, when you ridicule Christ, you are ridiculing the creator of all, the king of the universe. I suspect we could do with a little bit more humility. It is Jesus who says, I will declare. Now let me pull back a little bit and put this a warning in the context of the other three, we see that the narrow gate refers to an entry into the kingdom of heaven. And we enter the kingdom of heaven through obedience. We're told it will be hard. Straight off, we're told it will be hard. And then we're told about false prophets. They're the ones that produce bad fruit. They're the ones who have taken the wide road. The difference between a good and bad prophet is the fruit but not necessarily the fruit of ministry. 
It's the fruit of discipleship. It's the fruit of their life. A life led in obedience to Christ is the sort of fruit that we're talking about here. Now for a very sobering comment, which is why if you buy one of these motivational pieces of jewelry and you have it hanging around your neck, you occasionally you'll go, because <sighs> it acts like smelling salts. And sometimes when we need script, we read scripture, we need that effect. The wide road, we're told, is taken by many. The narrow road by few. Verse 22, many will say, Lord, Lord. The implication is that a lot of people will reject Jesus Christ. And in so doing, they reject the only hope they have. I mean, that seriously is sobering. Jesus is saying a lot of people will reject me, even though I am the only way to the Father. The warning against false prophets is a warning for us to be discerning of the claims made by others. But this passage in verse 21 to 23 gives us cause for self-evaluation. It's saying, look at your own life of discipleship. Yes, it does warn us against imitating people because their, their ministry is success, sex, successful. And we kind of assume that a successful ministry implies that what they're doing in their life is godly. Therefore, if we imitate what they're doing in their life, we also will have a successful ministry. No, it doesn't work like that. The warning here should give us cause to ask, what does it mean to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, a disciple? And what is the evidence of such a life? The answer is found, as I've said, and will keep saying over and over again, it's doing the will of God. Verse 24 puts it in summary form by saying, it's hearing and applying the teaching of Jesus. That's what a wise builder is, a person who builds their life on the foundation of Jesus' teaching. Verses 21 to 23 are about self-deception. Beware of self-deception. It's very easy for us to look at what God has done through our life and say, therefore, I'm okay. It's very easy for us to compare our life with other people's lives and say, therefore, I am okay. No, we have to actually evaluate ourselves and say, am I living according to Christ's rules? The key is application. It's not knowing Jesus' teaching. It's not even believing that Jesus' teaching is true. It's actually applying it. It's living in obedience to that teaching. That's when Christian discipleship will be revealed. A coach can give a pep talk to a team. We hear this all the time. You know, they're not following the game plan. The coach presents them with a game plan. The team hears the game plan. They understand the game plan. But if they don't actually put the game plan into practice, they won't get the result that they want. It's the application that becomes critical. Let me summarize here. And I'm going to summarize not just this sermon series, but the entire Bible. You're welcome. And... Um, Ah, so you missed the Grey Cup. Hey, if Toronto wins, who really wants to see that? Seriously, I could be doing you a big favour here. We have all, every one of us, this is the gospel message, every one of us has fallen short of God's expectations. We call it sin. We've all failed. We're all in the same predicament. We're estranged. That means we're separated from God and as a consequence, we live under condemnation. And there is nothing we can do about it. Not a single thing. And so God, being merciful and loving, decides to do something about it himself. He addresses the issue by sending his son, Jesus. He not only deals with the root problem through himself dying for us, for all of us, for people that have accepted or rejected Christ, the opportunity is still there. He also taught his disciples what was going on so that when they understood, in turn, they could let other people know 
what he had done for them. Just as we are to let other people know what it is that God has done for them. Christ's death and resurrection make reconciliation with the Father possible, but not obligatory. Okay? Let me say that again. Christ's death and resurrection make reconciliation. It means that our relationship with the Father can once again come together, be reconciled, but it doesn't automatically happen. You can reject Christ. You can refuse the invitation. If we accept Christ's claim, then we have to do more than acknowledge the claim or even believe the claim. We must actually obey it. And it's hard. It's really hard at times, but that doesn't change the truth. And this is why we need to do it together as a church why we need to do it together as a team because we're not likely all to find a heart at the same time and we can encourage each other we can build each other up we can walk the road together we must be willing therefore to be open to a self-evaluation as well as evaluation from others we must be willing to let people speak into our lives beware of those who simply befriend you so that they can reinforce your self-deception. So often we gather around people who are compromising because that way we can compromise a little bit easier ourselves. Those friends, those people that say they love you but tell you you're not necessarily doing the right things, maybe they're the ones who really do love you. Oftentimes I see and hear of people that compromise their friendship. They don't want to tell their people about Jesus because they don't want to risk being rejected by their friends. So they'll let their friends live without Christ. You're telling me that's love? Do you know what love is? Love is putting yourself out there so that your friends might reject you because you're giving them an opportunity for life. That's what love is, paying the price. Love is not self-protection and letting them walk off a cliff. In my introduction, I spoke of symbols. I'm really big on symbols. This is my fish hook. This one's actually made out of fossilized uh, walrus, uh, and there's a huge amount of meaning behind it. I like to collect uh, fish hooks because they remind me of my personal mission statement, which is, come follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And I collect these from all around the world, and they're all designed slightly different because it helps me realize that for me to fish for people, I have to use different types of hooks that are relevant to the culture in which I'm fishing. And so that's why I gather these. These are made out of local material. I got this one from Alaska. Um, and so it's a reminder of what my life priority is. Easter service uh, a while back, um, the person encouraged us to take some crucifixion nails. The real nails are bigger than this. These are just nails that represent the crucifixion nails. And I took it home and I shaped it into a fish hook. And the reason I did that was because it helped me connect my personal mission statement with the wider work of Christ. So the nail was symbolic of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection and the fish hook is symbolic of the role that I play in that wider mission. And my role, I believe my spiritual gift is in the area of teaching. Uh, if you disagree, don't tell me after this message. <laughs> and so it's as I exercise my gift within the community of God's people that together we achieve the overall mission um, that we have. I also showed you my latest necklace or my necklace uh, that is not yet fully designed, a toenail. And I suggested it was offensive and disgusting as can be verified from the front row there. But perhaps not as disgusting as the most popular symbol of Christianity, the cross. The cross is an emblem of torture, of suffering, of dishonor. The original cross would have been stained with blood, with bile, with human excrement. It stunk, and it was highly offensive. And we take that symbol and we hang it around our neck 
to remind ourselves of how far God was willing to go to have a relationship with us. That shows the depth of love that he has for us, is that he was willing to undergo that sacrifice. Now, unlike my genuine toenail jewellery, which you can still purchase in the foyer after the service, the cross people wear these days are stylized, artistic, even expensive pieces of jewellery that are all too often removed from the original event of Christ's crucifixion. The offense has been removed, and even those who openly reject Christ's teaching wear crosses. Like the name Christianity itself, crosses have lost meaning. We don't know what they mean. Ironically, in some circles, the cross stands for material and physical success and not a sign of suffering and dishonor. From the very beginning, people have struggled with this idea of God suffering. I'm going to read to you from um, Matthew chapter 16. Verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, forbid it Lord. This must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. If you think evildoers was bad, like this is pretty bad as well, right? Here's Peter, you know, one of Jesus' number one disciples, and he's just got told, you know, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what he has done. Even if we accept Christ had to suffer, many struggle with the notion that obedience to Christ, discipleship, means we too may have to suffer. And yet, when Christ tells us to take up our cross, he's not referring to a piece of bling. He's referring to the need to die to ourselves and to live as a people raised anew in Christ. The point is not that we seek suffering and sacrifice as an end in itself, that would be as meaningless as me running the Boston Marathon just so I can lose toenails. Okay, I lost five toenails this year at Boston. The reason I lost five toenails was one of circumstance. It was a hot day and people were throwing water at us because they were trying to cool us down, which means my feet get wet, which means my shoe, my foot slips in my shoe. And after doing this for about 10,000 times, uh, your toes swell up, go black, and the nails fall off. But that was not the objective. The objective was to win the race. It just happened to be a side product. I've run lots of races successfully and never lost a toenail. In fact, that's my preference. Just, you know, for reference here, my preference is not to lose toenails during marathons. The point is that the objective for the Christian is not to suffer. The objective is to serve Christ, to obey Christ, And suffering and sacrifice may result from achieving that goal. If Christ is indeed God incarnate and his teachings are true, and let me say this, the truth of Christ's teachings is not dependent upon you accepting them or rejecting them. They're true or they're not true. And just because you say, oh, well, I don't think they're true, it doesn't make them true. It just means you've rejected the only hope you have for life. If Christ's teaching is true and he is indeed God incarnate, then nothing he commands is preposterous. Nothing is preposterous. It's totally reasonable. Do you want to know what preposterous is? It's rejecting the only means that
that God has for our salvation, the person of Jesus Christ. Now that is preposterous. When people say, I reject Christ, it's like, I can't do that. Like, are you kidding me? You're giving up the only hope we have. As these four warnings all make clear, just as it is when I choose to run, I choose to run. I run because I want to run, because I want to go to Boston and run sub three hours. That's my goal. And the only way I can do that is if I run the race. I want to live with Christ. I want to live in heaven, whatever that means. I want to live with God. And the only way I can do that is to live a life in obedience to Christ. And that's the choice that we have. We can obey Christ or we can reject Christ. Personally, I choose Christ. And as hard as it has been sometimes, I never have ever regretted choosing Christ. I always regret when I reject him, when I disobey him, but I've never regretted a choice I've made for Christ. After the service, the coaches are going to take us into the back hall and they're going to give us an evaluation of our game so far. And as we listen to them and hear what they say, some of it will be encouraging, some of it will, I think, cause us to ponder. Remember what our goal is. Our goal is to fulfill the mission that God has for our church, to glorify God through Christ. Therefore, let's listen to what they have to say. Make whatever changes we need to, to ensure that we win the game. Why am I really wearing this jersey? It's because I want to be on the winning side. And you know what? If I wore a Stampeders jersey today, I don't know if they're going to win or not. After last year, I don't think they are. I hope they are. I'll cheer for them, but I don't know. But at least when I wear an all-black jersey, I know I'm on the side of a winner. Why? I'll tell you why. Because they played yesterday and I know the result. And I want to be on a winning side. And I want to be on God's side. you want to know why? Because Christ was crucified and raised in the past. I know the result. And I want to be on his team because I want to win. And I want you to join me. Let's pray. Father God, you are king. And Lord, you are a gracious God who sent your son to die that we may be reconciled with you, that we may live forever. And I pray that you would, Lord, for each person here this morning, you'd remove any self-deception that we have. You'd give us the courage to be able to evaluate our discipleship honestly. And Lord, the courage then to make necessary changes. Lord, we wish to honor you in all we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen.